So our Bible lesson this morning is entitled, God's Delight in His Son. In other words, we might well ask ourselves the question, in what or in whom does God take delight? In what or in whom does God have pleasure? Or perhaps to say this all in other words, what makes God happy? And no doubt there's a lot of biblical answers we could give, but this morning I wanted to focus on God's pleasure God's delight, God's joy, God's happiness in his son. And I think this is important because it sets an example for us. If God loves his son, so should we. And because God loves his son, that's point number one, because God loves his son, God seeks to honor his son. That will be point number two. So well, point number one, God loves his son. And then we'll just have a point number two later, God seeks to honor his son. And when we get to that point, I want us to see how it is that God honors his son. What is God doing to honor his son? And that's where you and I come in. God saves me, God saves you through his son, Jesus Christ, so that the son he loves will be honored and adored. So let's begin. Number one, God loves his son. So this shows us how much God enjoys his son, how much God loves his son. So we do have a battery of scripture references that we can survey, and we'll take them in order. So if you'd like, follow along in your Bibles to Matthew 3, if you will. Matthew 3 and verse 17. And again, these verses are focusing on how much God loves his son, how much he enjoys his son, how he takes pleasure in his son. And so this is the uh, baptism of Jesus recorded here and in Matthew 3 verse 17 we read and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased what God is saying there as he speaks from heaven this is the son whom I love and I take great pleasure in my son now, if you will, go to Matthew 12, Matthew 12, Matthew 12, the second reference there, Matthew 12 and verse 15. And here we actually have a quote from, uh, so what is it, Isaiah 42. We have a quote from Isaiah 42. And back in Isaiah 42, that was a passage that was foretelling of the coming of Messiah. So in Matthew 12, verse 15, Matthew 12, verse 15, and I'll just read part of this passage here. Matthew 12, verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. So what did Jesus know? He knew that the Pharisees were plotting and conspiring against him. They didn't like the fact that he healed a man on the Sabbath day, and Jesus taught that it was always right to do good, even on the Sabbath. So that upset the Pharisees. So when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. And he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will pour out my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. And the text goes on and describes the work and the ministry and the demeanor of Jesus' ministry. But note those words. God says, I love my servant. My servant is my beloved, and I'm pleased. My soul takes great pleasure in my servant, and I will pour out my spirit upon him so that he can do his ministry, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. In other words, there's coming a day when Jesus will rule on earth, and justice will sweep over the whole world, even among the Gentiles. And then if we go to Matthew 17, here we have the reference to Jesus taking Peter, James, and John up into the mountain, the mountain that became known as the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus' appearance was transfigured, if you will. It was transformed. And he exuded this special glory. And Jesus wanted Peter, James, and John to see 
Jesus showing that special glory. So if you're there now in Matthew 17, Matthew 17, notice verse 5. So while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. That would be Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So just like at Jesus' baptism, the voice comes from heaven. This is my son, says God the Father Almighty. This is my son. I love my son. And I take great pleasure, I have great joy, I have great delight in my son. So let's now go to the John, the John passages, and we'll take again these all in order. So if you will, go over to the Gospel of John, John 3. So right now we're just trying to establish the fact that Scripture teaches us, plain and simple, that God loves his son. He takes great pleasure in his son. We'll go to John uh, 3. We'll begin here and survey some of the passages in John. John 3. God loves his son, and so God is going to work to bring great honor to his son. So if you're there now in John 3, notice verse 35. John 3, verse 35. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. The next verse goes on to say, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. God is pleased to give all those who believe in his Son the gift of eternal life. We might ask ourselves, well, why would God want to do that? God loves his Son. God takes great pleasure in his Son. And as we'll learn in a minute, all those who honor the Son also show that they honor God the Father. And God also loves those who love his Son. So our salvation has been worked out, at least in part I think we could say, our salvation has been brought about out of God's love for his Son and his desire to honor his Son. All right, let's go to the, the chapter 5 passage. Uh, John, still in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 19. The beginning of the chapter, Jesus healed the man by the pool of Bethesda. He was lame, he was crippled, he was unable to walk. Jesus brings full healing, and he did that on the Sabbath day. So you can well imagine, some of the scribes and the Pharisees are now upset with Jesus, because Jesus is shattering their understanding of what could be done and not done, on the Sabbath. And so there's this animosity increasing against Jesus. But notice verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son does also in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And here's the great purpose of why God allows the Son to raise the dead and why God has appointed Jesus to judge all people. Verse 23. For the purpose that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So God has given certain things into the hand of Jesus. He's going to be the judge over all the world. He's going to rule. He has the power, the prerogative to raise the dead and to give life to whom he wills. Jesus has these prerogatives, these functions, these ministries, these assignments, you might say so that people will honor the Son in the same way that they honor and glorify God the Father. And that's what makes God happy, when people honor his Son, whom he loves. All right, let's go to the chapter 6 passage. If you look across the page, or flip the page, the next page, we have chapter 6. Here Jesus has uh, fed the 5,000. 
He multiplied the loaves and the fishes. And now he's talking about how he himself is the true bread, the true manna, the true food, the true sustenance that has come down to heaven for our good and our well-being. So notice, if you will, chapter 6, verse 37. Chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Notice in that verse, this verse speaks about all believers who are going to be given as a gift from God the Father to God the Son. Jesus will by no means cast out. So I just want you to think of yourself as a gift from God the Father to God the Son. Why does God the Father do this? Why are we given as a gift, a gift who believes in Jesus and wants to honor Jesus? Why does God do this? Why does God give us as a gift to God the Son? Because he loves his son, and he wants to honor his son. All right, the next verse, verse 38. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, notice that now, all that the Father has given Jesus. And he's talking about those who would come to believe in Jesus. These are the gifts from God the Father to God the Son. That all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise him up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus is honored by God the Father as we represent gifts from God the Father to God the Son. Furthermore, God the Son is honored in that he has been given the role of the function of raising us up at the last day. We look to Jesus as the one who himself was raised from the dead, who will also raise us up from the dead as well. And then notice in verse 40, Jesus says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son might believe. We might well ask ourselves, the question, well, why did God bring Jesus into the world? So we could see the Son. So that generation that was alive when Jesus was on earth could see the Son, and as a result of seeing the Son and seeing God at work in the Son, seeing all of God's love and mercy in the Son, they would believe in the Son. And by believing in the Son, Jesus is honored. Jesus is glorified. God is happy whenever any man, woman, or child believes in the Son because the Son is honored as the object of our faith. All right, let's continue on. Go to chapter 16, if you will. Just a couple more references in the Gospel of John. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And you should know this morning, God loves you very, very much. That God loves you more than you can imagine right now. And God has a special joy and delight in you because you love his son. That comes out in this passage. Notice John 16, now verse 26. John 16, verse 26. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you. I think this might mean in the day when Jesus has been crucified, raised from the dead, and he ascends back into heaven, in that day, you will ask in my name. In other words, you'll ask, to, you'll ask God the Father directly. You'll make your prayers and petitions to God the Father directly in the name of Jesus. And then he goes on to say, and I do not say that I shall pray for the Father for you. Well, that might be because Jesus is no longer on earth. Jesus is not on earth. He's ascended back to the Father. Disciples don't need to have Jesus to ask the Father on their behalf while he's on earth. Jesus isn't here. He's gone back into heaven. The disciples now can pray directly to God the Father Almighty in the name of Jesus. Why is that so? How is it that these disciples can just boldly approach God the Father Almighty in the name of Jesus? Notice verse 27. For, here's the reason why. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Wow. We're loved by God. God has special joy and delight in us because we love his son, whom he also loves. Now let's go to chapter 17. If you will, just go across the page. Uh, John 17, 
And here we have the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Jesus is interceding, especially for his disciples and all those who would come to believe in him through the ministry of his disciples. So in John 17, we get down to verse 22. Remember now, Jesus is praying to God the Father here. Verse 22 says, And the glory which you, the Father, gave me, Jesus, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I've often thought about what that word glory means. Jesus is saying, Father, the glory, the very glory that you have given me, I have also given to them that they may be one, that they may be a unity. And I've, I've often thought that that glory, glory might be the love, the love of God the Father, the love of God the Father for his Son. And that love is passed on to the disciples, passed on to believers so that we might live in unity because the love of God and the love of Jesus pervades the Christian community. We get down to verse 24. Notice verse 24. Uh, Jesus says to the Father, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me. That would be believers, with the believers that would have been given to Jesus. I also desire whom also you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For, notice the explanation, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. I almost wonder if the glory of which Jesus speaks is the glory, the wonder, the splendor, the magnificence of being loved by God the Father for all eternity. Jesus says, you've given me this glory, this privilege, this honor, being loved by you for all eternity. And I want my disciples to know how much I am loved by you, O Father in heaven. And then we get down to verse 26, the very last verse of Jesus' prayer. Notice verse 26. Jesus says, I have declared to them, I have declared to my disciples, I have declared to them, all those who believe in me, I have declared to them your name. And I will declare it. In other words, I'll keep on declaring. I'll keep on showing and revealing your name, God, to my followers. That, for the purpose that the love, the love with which you have loved me, says Jesus, may be in them. And I in them. Maybe what Jesus means, and I with my love in them too. Wow. Perhaps the best way we can show our love for Jesus, and the best way that we can honor Jesus, is just by saying, God, may your love be in me. May your love be working in me, controlling me, moving me, inspiring me, filling me. The best way we can honor Jesus himself is to say, Jesus, I want your love to be in me, working in me, filling me, controlling me, and just exuding forth from my life that others can see the awesome love of God working in my life. So that in the end, Jesus will be honored by more and more people. They will come to believe as well. And one last reference in this section is Colossians 2 and verse 13. Colossians 2 and verse 13. So if you will, flip over to Colossians. Colossians uh, chapter 2. No, chapter 1. That's a mistake. It should be chapter 1 and verse 13. All right, Colossians chapter 1. Here's another important reference that tells us that God the Father loves God the Son. So this is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. So it says, He, that's God the Father, He has delivered us, that's us believers, from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We have been transferred out of the power of darkness would have been translated or transferred into the kingdom of the Son whom God the Father loves. Wow, we're in that kingdom. And by being in the kingdom of the Son whom God the Father loves, we get in on that love as well. Praise the Lord. So God the Father loves the Son. The scripture makes that clear. But I suggest a few reasons why God the Father loves the Son. And I don't want us to think that these are the only reasons. 
But in letter A, the Son is the fullness of deity. The Son is also divine. The Son is God. And I believe God has a special happiness in being God. And he takes delight in his Son because his Son is God. And if you're there in Colossians, since we're there in Colossians anyway, notice verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19. I'm having a problem with this ear loop on my mask. All right. I think it's going to hold. <laughs> uh, chapter 1, verse 19. For it pleased, notice that word pleased, it pleased the Father, it brought pleasure to the Father, it brought joy and happiness to the Father, that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. That would be all the fullness of deity should reside in Jesus. So when Jesus comes and visits on earth, Jesus is showing us what God is like. And then if you want to look at chapter 2, verse 19, look at chapter 2, verse 19, or two, or chapter 2, verse 9, rather, chapter 2, verse 9, uh, there the Apostle Paul says, for in him, in Jesus, dwells what all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. And you are complete in him, you are complete in Jesus, who is the head of all principality. So I think God the Father loves God the Son because Jesus is God. Letter B. God the Father also loves God the Son because God the Son reveals God perfectly to us. If you're there in Colossians, have another reference in Colossians here. Just notice back up in chapter 1, verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. He, that is Jesus, is the what? The image. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of the preeminent one, the honored one over all creation. For by him, that is by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And the text goes on to say that Jesus is before all things and in him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn, the preeminent one, the honored one from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. We see there how much God wants to honor his son. A couple other references. I think you know these. Uh, John 1, 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we see the glory of Jesus, we're also looking at the very glory of of God the Father. John 1 verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, but the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He, the Son, has declared, has revealed God the Father to us. And then the Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 passage, if you want, let me just turn to this one, I'll refer to this one, Hebrews chapter 1, we have this great statement about the identity of Jesus in uh, Hebrews chapter 1. There we're told that God has spoken in times past through the prophets. He's now speaking to us and revealing himself through God the Son, who is what? God the Son is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. And Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. So I believe God the Father loves God the Son because Jesus is God and Jesus perfectly and fully reveals God to us. All right, point number two. Point number two is simply that God seeks to honor his Son. God loves his Son. Now he wants to honor his Son. You know, as parents, we're always happy. A certain sense of pride uh, wells up in our heart when our children are honored when they get a special award or special recognition for a job well done, uh, we feel honored as well because they're our children. Uh, we helped raise them by the grace of God. And so think of uh, how God the Father is happy, how much joy he has when his son, the son whom he's loved for all eternity, whom he seeks to honor, is honored by us. So God seeks to honor the Son. Well, how does he do it? I've suggested some things here. Uh, don't limit our understanding of how God honors the Son to just this list, but some things I thought about was letter A. God seeks to honor his Son by saving us through his Son. 
Remember last Sunday when we studied uh, Romans chapter 5? We read time and time and again. We have peace with God. What? Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. We have our access into this grace. And we read time and again that we have something through Jesus or on the basis of Jesus. Uh, Christ died for us. Uh, he paid the penalty for our sins while we were still sinners. So Christ did all of these things for us. But why is God saving us through his son? So that his son might be honored. Because when we come to put our full faith and trust in Jesus, God is happy because we're honoring his son. The son becomes the object of our faith. And the son becomes the object of our praise. And the son becomes the object of our happiness and our joy and our contentment. Uh, the son becomes uh, the person we obey. Uh, the son becomes the person under whose lordship we, we desire to live. And so God saves us through his son so that we might become that large following of people that love and adore his son. So just keep that in mind. There's one mediator between God and human beings, and it's the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us. Why? God is honoring his son by saving us through his son. Letter B, God honors his son not only by saving us through his son, but also by conforming us to the image of his son. Now here's one verse I would like you to turn to. I don't have it listed here, but if you would, go to Romans 8, if you will. Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. So God saves us through his son, so that in our own eyes, in our own mind, Jesus might be elevated and lifted up and exalted as the one who is our Savior. But God also conforms us to the likeness of his Son, so that his Son might be honored and exalted. So I want you to see these words for yourself. Notice uh, Romans 8.28, a verse we probably well know. Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good, to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. And here's his big purpose in verse 29. For whom he, that is God, foreknew, he also predestined, and here's the purpose, to be conformed to the image of the likeness of his Son. In order that he, Jesus, the Son of God, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That Jesus might be the honored one, the one who's lifted up and adored and loved and served among many brethren. So that's why God saves us through Jesus. And that's why God's conforming us into the image of Jesus. So that we would look up to Jesus, as it were, as our elder brother. We are, as it were, all the brothers and sisters of Jesus who look up to him, love him, and serve him, and worship him, and honor him. So we're being conformed to Jesus as an expression of God's joy in his son and God's quest to honor his son. Let's go to letter C, if you will. God seeks to honor his son. Let's look at this from another angle, if you will. God seeks to honor his son by putting him on the cross and then raising him from the dead and then exalting him to his right hand. Wow. I think of Isaiah 53.10. You know what that says? Isaiah 53.10. Yet... It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to bruise the Messiah. He, God the Father, has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Yes, God the Father was pleased to crucify his son. Wow. Why would that be? Because Jesus then becomes our Savior. And after Jesus is raised from the dead, people everywhere start to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And then Jesus is honored as the object of our faith. The one who went to the cross to save us. The one who shows the Father's love to us. The one who sits in heaven right now as our intercessor, who secures our everlasting relationship with God the Father. And then, of course, we know that by raising Jesus from the dead... Obviously, there's a lot of people that believed in Jesus and, and exalting Jesus. Jesus left the earth. He went and he sat down where? At the right hand of God the Father, waiting till his enemies are someday made his footstool and Jesus reigns supreme. Why is God doing all that?
because God loves his son. And he wants to honor his son. And so Jesus, by, by saving us, by bringing us his salvation, brings us into that group of people that also love his son and whose lives are also bringing great honor to the son. We are all gifts from God the Father to God the Son. Remember that passage we read earlier for our scripture reading in Philippians chapter 2? God has highly exalted Jesus. Why? God loves his son. God has highly exalted Jesus and given to him the name that is above every name. Why? God loves his son and wants to honor his son. So that everything, whether well, things on earth, things under the earth, should all just worship and glorify the Father and confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. God does this out of love for his son, out of his quest to honor his son. I want you to think of how happy God is. Think of the joy and the elation and the euphoria that is in the heart of God when all these beings on earth bow the knee and confess from their heart that Jesus is Lord. Wow. As Christians, Jesus is our Lord. We be believe in him not only as our Savior, but as Lord, as one who died, was raised from the dead. Uh, and, and we have surrendered our hearts and our lives to his Lordship, to his mastery over our lives. Think of how happy that makes God. And then letter D, my last point, is God seeks to honor the Son. Letter D, God seeks to honor the Son by appointing the Son to be the judge and the ruler over all the world. Right now, Jesus is alive. He's with God the Father. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. But we're waiting for the time when Jesus comes back. And God is going to rule and reign over this world through who? His Son, Jesus. And Jesus is going to be honored as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Why? God loves his son. And God gave his son this ministry, this task, this function, so that Jesus might be uplifted and elevated in the minds and in the thinking of human beings everywhere, especially among believers. We read in, uh, I think it's uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back with his saints. And we're going to be that company that company of believers that admire and adore Jesus. And this all brings great happiness to God the Father. So uh, to make a couple of applications in conclusion here, let's love Jesus because God the Father loves Jesus. Let's love what God loves. And then as God the Father desires to exalt and honor his Son, let's also exalt and honor Jesus. So we can do this just by keep, by as, as we keep believing in him, as we love him, as we serve him, as we obey him, and especially as we allow the love of Jesus into our lives, and we allow the love of Jesus to change me and to fill me and to control me and to move me, so that my life becomes a showcase and a witness for the life and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus is modeled in me, when Jesus' love is, is instilled with me and working in me, God is most happy. God is most pleased. Because the image of his son, whom he loves, resonates in my life. So let's realize as we close in prayer how much we are loved by God because we love his son. And let's ask us, uh, let's ask God as we close in prayer to help us to honor his son whom God loves more than we'll ever know. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us, help us believers with all of our faults and our failures. Lord, we know all too well we're still sinners. We ask that you would help us by your grace to love your son, even as you love your son. And Lord, we simply ask that you would help us, help us to honor your son. Fill us with the love of your son that others might see the life and the love of Christ in our lives. May your son always be adored and loved by us. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus who so freely gave his life for us on the cross. How could we do anything less than love your son? In his name we do pray. Amen. Amen.